Hello everybody. Next up we've got Burnley at home. Kickoff on Saturday is 3pm. Well, that'll never catch on. Amazon Prime have the viewing rights, so you do something clever on your phone. Somebody comes around, rings your doorbell and leaves behind a stadium in a box containing a full Premier League match. If your front lawn isn't big enough for the 10 times too big a box the match will arrive in, why not try the mixture of male pattern baldness, hirsute lockdown haircuts and boomerangs that is usually on display on the Eyes Up Mother Brown thing on YouTube. Burnley then. Well, it was a lousy start to the season for them, which consisted of them losing matches, while manager Dyche swapped moaning about opponents diving for issuing not-so-subtle coded messages to the then-owners about a lack of investment. Their first six games saw defeats away at Leicester and Newcastle and at home to Southampton, Spurs and Chelsea. A nil-nil draw at the Hawthorns brought forth their only point in this spell in a match that lived, well, down to expectations. Things did perk up a little bit after that. A point from a nil-nil draw at Brighton was followed by their first win at the eighth time of asking, beating Palace 1-0 at Turf Moor. After a rather predictable 5-0 reverse at Man City, they went four unbeaten, drawing at home with Everton, beating Arsenal at the library, picking up a point at Villa Park and then defeating Wolves at home. Their first defeat in a month came away at Leeds before they joined the long line of teams to defeat Sheffield United 1-0. Their first match of the year came the other night at home to Manchester United, where they went down 1-0. All of that has left them in 16th spot from 16 played with 16 points, which has a nice symmetry about it, I suppose. Of course, since the early part of the season, those not-so-coded messages to the board will now be delivered to a new set of ears. American investment company ALK Capital finally completed their purchase of 84% of the club for £170 million. Relations between the former chairman Mike Garlick and Dyche were allegedly somewhat strained, so the encouraging noises from the new head honcho Alan Pace have been probably music to Dyche's ears. We will see what an amazing manager he is, was Pace's comment, only in an American accent after their first meeting last week. Meanwhile, Pace may well get to regret his promise to move and live in Burnley. I mean, yes, there's nice countryside within a few minutes' drive, but you can never escape the fact that it's a few minutes' drive from Burnley. Meanwhile, Mr Pace, if you've got any other mates willing to invest a few bob in a team playing in claret and blue, you know where to send them. The lack of squad depth that everybody has sort of not been talking about up there can be gauged from the major squad strengthening that took place during the summer window. Not. Daisy, the socially distant support bubbling personal assistant, with a beautiful smile, informs me that they spent a million pounds on Brighton midfielder Dale Stevens, a fee fully reflecting the 31-year-old player's age. He's missed a few games with hamstring problems, though he was on the bench for the Man United game the other night. The other signing of note was the arrival of backup keeper Will Norris for a fee in the hundreds of thousands rather than the millions. Although nominally on the books at Wolves before the move, he spent last season on loan at Ipswich, making 20 appearances before they all packed up and went home in League One. With those two and a few youngsters coming in during the summer, Clarets fans, and indeed Deitch, will be hoping that the new owners will have some sort of transfer kitty to play with over the next few weeks. Another run of the type with which they commenced the season would expose the fragility of what is only a five-point gap from the bottom three at the time of writing. Top scorer in the league at the present is Jade Rodriguez. He has six in six, a troublesome knee having reduced his availability in recent weeks. He should be available at the weekend, though, having come, through, come on as a sub against Man United the other night as they chased an equaliser. Another recent absentee has been midfielder Charlie Taylor. His hamstring injury was picked up following a foul in the win against Sheffield United. Dyche blaming, as usual, referee's failure to give fouls when players stay on their feet. Whilst Dyche may have a point, I would take him just a little bit more seriously if he were to express similar opinions about players feigning injury in the penalty box to stop an attack. Something I'm willing to place a small side wager on occurring this weekend. Taylor, meanwhile, is rated no better than 50-50 to return at this moment in time. So let's move on, shall we, to the wild and wacky world of association football. Covid continues to cast a shadow over fixture lists. The Premier League sent officials over to each member of the Fulham squad to get them out of bed to play at Spurs the other night, 
So it's most amusing to see them not to play ball and pick up a point there. Meanwhile, north of the border, Celtic, who are having a good go at trying to be the first team ever to finish third in a two-horse race, have had their chief exec admitting that the recent trip to Dubai might, with hindsight, not have been the greatest idea in the world. He was, of course, quite wrong. It was a bloody stupid idea right from the off. Hindsight shouldn't have come into it. Unless, of course, he was referring to the venue for their little jaunt. Maybe the Seychelles might have been better. Talking of Dubai, there are worrying noises coming out of Derby, whose players haven't been paid for quite some time now. This comes as a takeover by Dubai-based interest is still in progress, despite completion being promised by Christmas. I guess they didn't specify a year. All the noises coming from the club suggest that the paperwork is just about complete and there's nothing to worry about, which of course is precisely the phrase people use when there is something to worry about. So it could be one to keep an eye on. Whilst on the subject of matters financial, it will not have escaped your notice that the number of directors at our own club has expanded somewhat. I'm sure Mr Sullivan's long-term partner, Ms Benton Hughes's past career as an actress, whilst inexplicably unburdened by her having to find storage space for Oscar statuettes, has left her more than well-placed to take an active role in running a multi-million pound business like a football club. Similarly, Mr Sullivan's son, Dave Jr., will have probably picked up some tips from his dad. The gold side of the chairmanship have been similarly busy. Daniel Cunningham, a city broker, has presumably been appointed for his financial skills, as opposed to the fact that David Gold is his father-in-law. Meanwhile, at the age of 83, Gold's business associate, Charles Cross, is presumably too young to be the Jack the Ripper suspect from the 1880s. Meanwhile, it all seems a complicated way of getting your mates into a match during lockdown. A long while ago, it was suggested that each club should have a supporter appointed to its board. It never happened. Funny how quickly clubs can move when they want to, though, isn't it? And let's move on to our last game, then. Well, we made hard work of it, I suppose, though some leniency of thought can be given in view of the fact that it's always difficult to attack the shallow end at Edgeley Park. I swear it hasn't stopped raining since the infamous Ian Dowie match in 1996. Having said that, there were still a couple of subpar performances out there from players one might have hoped would have wanted to make more of an impression. In the end, this match highlighted, yet again, the lack of depth in the squad. I'm sure Antonio played for longer than the medical team might have wanted. And one heart-in-mouth moment from Randolph, whose 180-degree off-target punch was clearly designed to give comfort to anyone feeling nostalgic for the days of Roberto, was a constant reminder of Fabianski's importance to the side. The fact that the squads need strengthening is not news. If only we had some new directors appointed for their independence of thought, who could raise the matter with the owners, perhaps? The injury list has expanded of late. <laughs> Frederick's quarantine period should be coming to an end shortly, though the timing will probably preclude him from being able to build up much in the way of match fitness. Balbuena is now in Covid corner, though. Matuaku is still out, though Fabianski is more likely than not to be available. The odd one is Diop, whose unspecified knock is not the most convincing of ailments that I've ever heard. He was OK on Sunday, but not 100% on Monday, apparently. At the time of writing, he's listed as 50-50. Nobody seemed bothered enough in the press call to ask what the problem was. All a bit rum. Prediction? Well, I can see this one being a bit similar to Stockport, albeit without the sort of weather that has animals forming two abreast queues alongside marine vessels fashioned from gopher wood. From what little I've seen of Burnley of late, they appear to have been playing deep, attacking on the counter. That's the sort of game we've actually struggled in of late. Though, they may rate us lowly enough to be a bit more attacking than usual. Let's be optimistic, shall we? £2.50 I would have spent on fireworks to be set off near to the clearly pyrotechnic-phobic Mike Dean will instead be sent to Mr Winston to wager on a home win. Let's call it 1-0 to us then. Enjoy the game.